morning guys. How's everybody doing? How's the body after four days of fun? Yeah, this is my and I week number 16 in a row. And in the last five, seven years, every time I'm flying into Austin, I try to do this mental exercise. Okay, this year is going to be different. <laughs> I'm going to go to bed early. I'm not going to drink as much. I'm going to exercise. And then what happens is, on the Monday, on the following Monday, so I usually fly on Sunday, because I, I, I'm a wise partner, and then I can go to my stay on, on Monday. So Monday morning, I usually exercise. And then from that point on, nothing happens other than the usual fun. <laughs> so hey, my name is Philippe Alto. I'm principal at TS Actors. Uh, we're an alliance partner company based out of uh, the Bay Area in, in California. And uh, we focus on uh, embedded applications and uh, leveraging low-cost tools for best measurement solutions. But that, what folks were saying, that always happens to me, but I end up being drunk to the gym. That's bad. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so my name is Stefan Benmu. I work for Alabama Engineering. We do a lot of custom applications for embedded software and uh, LabVIEW-based test systems and we specialize mainly in medical devices. And I think, to speak uh, for both of us, I think we have a passion for bringing LabVIEW to low-cost embedded systems. So that's kind of why we are presenting here today. And just to go through the agenda, we're gonna go over, we'll, we'll take a show of hands here and skip through the easy stuff if you guys are all familiar. But we're gonna go through a microcontroller overview, um, Arduino overview, Arduino's for test and measurement, um, and then we'll talk about the Arduino compatible compiler for LabVIEW, which is available on the tools network, and then some Arduino specific applications and examples. <coughs> now, first, does everybody know what a show, show me your hand if you don't know what a microcontroller is. Okay, everybody knows. That's <laughs> awesome. Good. So, the, quick summary it's got processor core, memory, peripherals, everything built into one IC, and usually programmed with C and C. And you got a kind of a you know infinite while loop and some limited interrupts. Does everybody know what an interrupt is? Show me your hand if you don't know what an interrupt is. Okay, good. Okay, you know, one back there. Great. All right. So an interrupt is something that interrupts normal execution to do something else. And after it's done executing that piece of software, it returns back to back to where it left off in your normal while loop. And so that could be like a pin changing state or a timer interrupt. And so some of the common architectures and microcontrollers that are out there, AVR, which is at and that's pretty much what Arduino uses, uh, PIC is microchip, and MSP430 is by TI. And so some of the common memories you find on a microcontroller, you have flash, and that's where your program memory resides, and obviously that maintains state over a power cycle. You have RAM, and that's where all your variables are stored and manipulated, and obviously when you lose power, that gets cleared out. Um, and then you have PE problem, which is very much like Flash, but it's kind of a one byte access, whereas Flash is a page access. So that's very useful for things like configuration, like if you're storing um, your program that needs to store a configuration on a power cycle, um, you would do that in PE problem. And all this can be a lot slower than Flash because it's a single byte access. All right, just show me your hand if you don't know what Arduino is or never heard of it. Awesome. This is a little different than last year. Yeah. Last year we had a few hands. Yeah. Okay, so I'll get through this pretty quick then. Uh, it's an open source electronics platform. Um, it's great for hobbyists and artists. Um, we don't want to deal with the details of electronics design. It's available off the shelf. All of the schematics and hardware is available to you to um, use as is, um, or you can create your own product with those designs. And uh, the boards can be, like I said, purchased as is off the shelf. So you can just use them as, and drop in shields. We'll go over that in a second. They can be used for anything from simple applications to you know, lighting LEDs, testing measurement, uh, recording data, and displaying it on LCD. I like that home automation one, kind of an automated bartender. Um, and robotics even, which is very popular for Arduino. This is a few other common boards. None of those are already. I kind of structure those as good, better, best. You have the Uno, kind of on the lower end, uh, 16 megahertz microcontroller, very limited on flash and RAM, but it's your low end uh, price point, usually about 20 bucks. 
we have with Mega, which is a little bit better, give you more I.O., more flash, more RAM, um, a little higher price point. And then the Dewey is on the higher end, and that's I've got a, an ARM Cortex CPU, a lot more flash RAM because you've got 96 kilobytes of RAM. And that's where you kind of run into trouble mainly is your RAM. Having more RAM is obviously going to be a lot better for uh, programs that are using a lot of variables. Who does not know what a shield is? Okay. So a shield is something you plug into the top of our Arduino. So our Arduino base board is like, it's got your microcontroller, it's your memory, your CPU, your brains. Whereas a shield is your peripherals. Um, although base boards do have peripherals, I.O., these are, these extend those peripherals. So if, if you want to do something specific like data logging with a real-time clock, there's a shield for that. Relay shield, LCD, rangefinder, Ethernet, uh, Bluetooth, motor shields, the motor control. So all these are just examples. There's tons of shields out there. So you can literally buy these things off the shelf and plug them into Arduinos. And away you go for your specific application. And most of the software is free. Now, the software, you, you can find open source libraries in C or C++, and you can modify those as needed, or use them as it is. Yes, that's exactly right. A lot of the shields you can add on and stack them up, so you can combine. Some of them, you know, they're still called shields, but they don't necessarily stack like the Bluetooth one. You would just wire pin to pin. But you can, you know, get breakout shields that break out all the I.O., and then you can wire those to uh, outside shields. You yeah, just need to be a little careful. Looking at the resources that the show uses, using a variety of them use SPI. So you need to make sure that you're not using shields that won't fit in the SPI. Yeah, you got to make sure that you're not using the same I/O between different shields. Okay, so uh, although we went through that uh, baseline and found the foundation of what our Arduino is. How can we use that in our industry? How, how can we leverage that platform in our industry? So as Stefan went through, microcontrollers are real-time machines, right? So they're a natural fit for very simple embedded control and data logging applications. Um, we, we can use them on embedded monitoring applications, rapid prototyping, if we're just testing an idea, selecting something together real quick to see if it works. Those guys are great for that because of obvious, obviously they're very low cost. Um, and it's a low-cost alternative when the requirements are not stringent. And, and this here is one of, one, of, one of the points that I would like you to keep in mind. Uh, anybody from an eye? There you go. We love you guys. <laughs> <laughs> We're not competing with national incidents, because otherwise it would kill you. <laughs> so Arduinos are not a replacement for the real platform. Obviously, microcontrollers are very, very tiny, whereas the real platform is incredibly powerful. What about LabVIEW and Arduinos? Uh, nowadays, you cannot talk about testing measurements without talking about LabVIEW. LabVIEW became very quickly the de facto programming uh, environment for test measurement applications. So that's where uh, Stefan and I uh, come into to, to add some value here to, to the industry. We create a bit of what, what is a, a cross compiler really that takes a lab UVI, interprets it, and compiles it and download it to run embedded in the Arduino target. So this is not a, a better solution, meaning that we're not connecting uh, a host PC to the Arduino while it runs. We're actually programming the Arduino itself in LabVIEW. Who didn't get that? Awesome. So, we can obviously use the low cost platform in LabVIEW for simple embedded applications. And as we came to find, uh, to find out, there are some very smart folks out there that are actually going <coughs> above and beyond the simple aspect of it, as, as you will see a little later on, on, on the demo that we have. Um, more than 100 primitives supported, most data types, I think cluster is one of the ones that we can support, right? Cluster is in two-dimensional arrays. Yes. 
built-in memory optimization algorithms. Uh, we had to actually make, make LabVIEW fit in these little guys. And, and as Stefan showed, uh, the Uno, for instance, has 2K of RAM. So if we didn't do this, this product will be basically useless. And there's a, obviously a, a palette for interfacing with the Arduino resources. OK, so when you install the compiler, the compiler creates a palette that basically combines the primitives that are supported by the tool. So this is basically the same primitives. This is not something different. We're just kind of combining them here in this palette just for convenience of the user, just so the user knows what is supported and what's not supported. So once you program your Arduino, you just open this palette and you basically select your primitives from here. Uh, and I'm, I'm just showing some snapshots here of the primitives, but it's your usual Latin, right? Uh, structures and, and Boolean strings, numeric controls, and numeric functions, and those things. And we have a set of API VIs that are used to access the Arduino resources uh, themselves. And, and again, another point. The first point was we're not competing with AI. The second point is we are actually downloading the VI to run embedded and headless on the Arduino target. Cool. What do you mean by headless? You can disconnect from your host PC, plug in the power supply, you and then the interface. No. I mean, yeah, it's, it's yeah, basically. It, it doesn't have the horsepower to run the user interface to begin with, right? You, we had the capability to do like a, if you wanted to attach an LCD, where you can do a simple interface. And there's actually other LCDs that operate embedded themselves, and you interface with them over UI. So you know, that can be supported with this platform. So this compiler is free and open source, and you can run product. Yeah, it's a product. Uh, we have two editions, and, but the functionality is exactly the same. Uh, one, of the, the only difference is the licensing uh, terms. Uh, one is for home projects uh, and academic use. So if you're having fun at your house, making an automated bartender thing, then it's, you, you use the home. If you're making a project for your company or if you're making a product using the tool, anything that it's commercial, that you're going to make money off of it, and then it's, it's the standard license. So the home, home license is $99, and the uh, commercial license is $499. There's some product information up here too. You guys feel free to come up and grab it after that's some information on life information. Okay. <laughs> yeah, this is a new line from So this is showing a yeah. code snippet here in LabVIEW. That's one of the examples that shifts the product. Uh, as you can see here, regular LabVIEW, right? Some this is using some uh, I squared C. Uh, API VIs to access the i c resources on, on the Arduino. And the exercise that we went through was, okay, let's run this and see what would come out in C. If we were to program this in C, what would this, this is the whole application by the way, what would this look like, like in C? So we're showing here, uh, it would be equivalent to 16 pages of C code. Here. All right, so one of the common questions we get, and of course you're going to ask, okay, wh what happens if I put two loops together? I want to run multi threads. Uh, well, unfortunately, because of the AVR architecture, it's not multi threaded, so you can't do this. So, what happens if you were to do this in one of the VIs and deploy it to the Arduino? It will actually run the first loop and then run the second loop. Now, if your first loop doesn't quit, like you see here, it's got a false tied to the stop. Uh, then the second loop will never run. However, there is a way you can do multi-threading sort of. So what you can use is what's called timer interrupts. So you, have, you can set up timer interrupt through uh, our compiler. There's an API, and not only that, you can tie a callback VI to the input. So the callback VI can essentially be something that runs in another thread on an interval, and you can share data between the two using a global variable. So that's typically how you do it. If you want something very time-dependent, you would do that in the callback VI. And just like with embedded, you really want your interrupts or your callback VIs to run very quick. 
So it would be something as simple as um, you know uh, setting a flag and then the remain doing the horsepower of the, the most of the work there instead. But we'll go through an example here to show where that's useful. And actually that's a picture of it right there on the right. The pointer. Yeah, so yeah. So on the right you can see we set up we're setting an output uh, and we're attaching an interrupt here called that. And this is just performing a calculation. But typically you wouldn't want to do something that's time critical in this loop because this is an array of 500 elements and it's iterating on that every iteration of the loop. So let's go through the demo on that. Okay, so like I said, down for this here. Use interrupts for parallel parallelized like processing using callback APIs, and it's useful for generating time critical events. And we do support at any setting it anywhere from one microsecond to eight point three seconds. <coughs> I've got an Uno and a, we're just sandwiched together, but they're not really, they're connected together. I have an Uno and a, just a small Ravi DAC card, and I'm just measuring the output of a digital output. I'm acquiring it with a Ravi DAC just to show the timing. So, first thing I'm going to do is open this example, and we're going to, this is what we're going to download to the Uno. And similar to the example on the previous slide, we've got an array of 500 elements. And what we want to do is create a square wave on the output. So let's say we want to create a, a square wave at a particular frequency. Um, so we're doing that here by just toggling the output on, on the digital out. So we're just reading the current value, inverting it, and writing it back. At the same time in this loop, we're also doing some computations on a big array. Uh, and this actually takes a good amount of time because the way auto indexing is enabled is the memory has to be reallocated on every iteration. So it takes a significant amount of time on a small target like this to do that. So let's go ahead and download this. So this is a compiler. So essentially all we're doing is loading that API and compiling and downloading. And we've got the COM port of the boards pre-selected here. So there it's done. So now if we open, we run our DAC application, we'll see our square wave here. This is being acquired on the digital. And you see the frequency is kind of jumping around. And that's because it's making that calculation on specific iterations of the loop and it's messing with our, our digital output toggling. We're not getting our precise frequency. So what we can do, let's open one that uses interrupts. So very similar, computation is the same in the main while loop, but we now have attached to this timer interrupt a callback DI. And in that callback DI, all we're doing is toggling, toggling the IO. So this one we don't need to share any data, because there's nothing really going on that needs to be shared. We're just toggling the, the output to get the frequency we want. And we can configure the frequency very precisely here by just setting the period so the input to the timer interrupt, you just specify what, how frequent you want to run that interrupt or that DI. <coughs> so and so all I had to do basically to select it was I had it in my recent DI's list that you can also browse to a DI. And once it's loaded, you can either just compile or compile and download. So compile would be used to just check that your code compiled OK first. You may not have to have a board connected. In this case, we're going to download the board. And once it's downloaded, you should see it here with what was keep requiring. Programming. And there you go. So it's pretty solid at 100 hertz. Any, any questions here? So this Yeah. Right, so that trigger is the interrupt. So you're, 
when you say attach the callback AI to the timer one interrupt, you're specifying a period. And as soon as your program runs, that timer is going off on that period and calling that VI. Does that make sense? Yeah, so yeah, this is your this is what starts it pretty much. As soon as you attach it. Now, you can also do this, we don't show it here, but you can do it by the pin changing state. So anytime a digital input goes from low to high or high to low, then it can also call a VI. So there's a there's a separate API for that instead instead of saying attached timer interrupt, it would be I think it's attached digital interrupt. All right, so as we mentioned earlier, there's a lot of memory considerations when you're dealing with LabVIEW on these small targets. And we have optimization algorithms built in to help so you don't have to do any thinking. Um, so just some overview of what the compiler is actually doing and how data types are implemented helps us to figure out what's the best way to you know, code something so that it fits and runs properly. So just uh, as an overview, scalar data types um, so numerics and that sort of thing use what's called automatic duration variables. And so automatic duration variables are allocated on stack. Does everybody know what the stack and heap are? Raise your hand if you know. Okay. So those are allocated on the stack, which means if you have allocations in the sub DI, which is treated as a function by our compiler, which is the C function, they are deallocated when the function returns, when the sub DI returns. Which is great because um, if you start wrapping things up as you should in sub DIs, your memory is freed as your as they return. Um, now we can only do that for scalar data types. Unfortunately, just the way let you expect LabVIEW to work for arrays and strings, we have to use dynamic memory allocation, which is allocated over heap, and that is very susceptible to fragmentation. Obviously, as you create something on the heap and then release it, um, you end up with gaps in your memory, and then you reallocate something that's bigger and may not fit in a conti contiguous memory space. The heap um, is it's another memory block, so usually the heap is allocated, it starts on the bottom, and the stack starts on the top, and they grow together. The heap is for dynamic memory. So I like, can see if you do a new, you know what a new is. Um, you're asking your uh, like OS-based systems, you ask the OS uh, or the driver for memory, a, a block of memory, and that comes from the heap. And then when you free that memory, it is, rele it is released on the heap and available for something else to use. So it's dynamic in that um, a any part of the code can access the heap and allocate memory. And it can grow and shrink, whereas the stack is more for scalar and it grows you know, one, one variable at a time. But the heap, you can allocate like you know, 100 bytes and then, and then try to out, like if you want to extend that to 101 bytes, the memory manager has to look for con a continuous 101 bytes. Like if you have 100 and there's memory taken before it and after it, it then has to release that memory, look for another slot of memory in the heap that's 101 bytes and then reallocate and copy your data there. So that's going on all under the hood. Um, nothing you have to usually worry about. LabVIEW does that for you and everything it operates on. And so the reason why we have to do these things on the heap is just that like if you're doing a concatenation of a string, or build a build array, or auto-indexing from the output of a loop, all those things have to dynamically change the size of the memory at runtime. So the problem, like I said, is when you're free, so you have free memory between your stack and your heap, and then as those get closer, and you start, you know, if you go deeper and deeper in a function, it's allocating more memory on the stack, or you're allocating more memory on the heap, and you get fragmentation, Eventually, if those collide, your system does unexpected things. So it may still run, but data may not be what you expect, or it may just lock up altogether. So what we try to do in the compiler is to do what's called automatic replaces. So you can imagine in LabVIEW, if you have a branch here, like this example, and you're operating, you're doing an operation on the input of that branch, you actually have to copy the memory to do that because you need to preserve the original uh, memory in order to, to you know, make parallel path uh, computations on that. So what, what we do is if you have a single path where you know, typically you do initialize array, 
and then you operate on that and it's, you know, send it to another to an output. We can do this all in place. So this would not produce a memory copy. This would just operate on the memory allocation in place so you're not duplicating your memory. So this saves, this is pretty huge. So some other things to keep in mind too, when you pass arrays to subdis, this will work in the compiler, but by definition, we have to copy memory to do that. Just because those things go in and out of subdis, everything is copied. So you have to consider that when you're dealing with large arrays, it may be better to use a global variable. Um, and obviously, just like uh, lab you embedded, you want to use the smallest data type necessary. Don't use a U32 if you only need a U8 and that sort of thing. Question? Yeah, it's just to catch them. Uh, to catch which area? Yeah, <coughs> yeah so. Yeah, this, this is light coming from. And also, this last bullet point um, you may or may not be able to catch it. We have an API that tells you how much memory exists, how much free memory exists. It doesn't necessarily tell you the fragmentation, but the amount of space between your stack and your heap. So uh, you can't, if that's, if you're referring to weird things and you check that and that's really low, it's probably because you've run out of memory. And we also do things to protect, like in the compiler, if there isn't enough memory, um, we check for that and <coughs> gracefully exit uh, so hopefully your, your program doesn't just lock up and crash, but it works with one exact phase. It's kind of lesser than two years. Yeah? Uh, when you set the sub PI to inline, uh, does your compiler still create a separate function and then have to allocate the data? Or no, we don't support the inline at all. So it just does the same thing every time. Yeah. All right. Uh, here's an optimization example that actually came from a customer. They, they had an issue trying to get the performance they wanted dealing with very large arrays. Now, um, just by nature of how the compiler works, there's ways to trick the compiler, and it doesn't follow normal lab view data flow, which is awesome, but it's kind of weird that this works out. You can trick the compiler to operate in line on large arrays. And in this example, if you just focus on this section here, it looks a little strange. So we initialize an array, and then we go into this infinite while loop. And we're rotating an element, and then we're going through um, a for loop on each of those elements, pretty much. Um, and then we're replacing an array, and then, and then taking the last element out. Now, what's weird is we don't do anything with the output of this and wire it back into the shift register. It, it will work. However, it will be less efficient because it has to do a memory copy to do that. So this way, the compiler already creates a slot in memory here. And every time it does this operation and this operation, it will operate in place. So every loop, reading this wire, will give you the latest uh, updated data. So it's a little awkward, but it will work very fast because it's all in line. So yeah, like it says there, you get the current value of the array on each iteration. Any questions? Is that clear? Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's doing a rotate, and it's also doing a replace um, on in the, the for loop itself. So both those operations are happening in place because there's no branch in the wire. Yeah. Can you repeat that? That was a fact. Go ahead. I'm just saying that uh, the speed implement for this versus the original shift register implementation is faster. So it's nine times faster doing this with the same functionality. Okay, so uh, debugging tools. So there are usually two major crashes that can potentially happen on any application, right? So we have compilation errors and runtime errors. For compilation errors, uh, we we have a, a fairly advanced uh, error handling mechanism. So we, we try to give you hints as to what is happening if there's a compilation error as you go through that process that Stefan showed to compile and download the VI. Um, and then hopefully that will guide you towards what you need to change. And the runtime errors is when the fun starts, right? Because you're trying to understand something that is happening on a little 2K memory, potentially for using Uno. Um, 
So we don't offer the usual frozen breakpoints if you are uh, debugging uh, a runtime problem. Uh, however, we do offer uh, you a free stack API, and that's what Stefan explained uh, about the, the, the stack and the heat gap in, in, in the memory. Uh, so like you mentioned, um, if you use that in combination with the serial monitor utility, and serial monitor utility is basically a uh, window into the serial communication between your host PC and your Arduino. So if, you're, if you use this in combination, what happens is, as your iteration uh, go through, if you're doing a, a, a loop <coughs> scenario, you can actually see a number that shows uh, how much uh, gap, how, much, uh, how big is the gap between the, the stack and the heap. So if, you're, if you start seeing this going down, 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 it's the case of that, right? It's, memory leak, basically. So you gotta, then at that point you gotta figure out, uh, go back to your VI and start doing memory uh, uh, optimization uh, techniques. And, and as part of the user manual, we have a whole section on tips and hints on what you can do to prevent uh, using too much memory. So that's a resource for you. And another point here is that if, if you're not, <coughs> No, there is actually a, a get free memory API with a with a flag on the input. So if you set this flag to true, you can just open the serial monitor, which is a utility uh, of the compiler, and that just pops up and, and it runs automatically. Yeah, under the hood, that there is a serial write in there, and you can do that. So you can drop the serial write if you want to throw some other information out in the serial terminal as well. So this is just an API that's ready to go. You drop it in automatically. So one, one thing to, to point out here is that if you're not using any Arduino resource on this, if you're just using library primitives, just be by using broken breakpoints, because right? we're not communicating to Arduino at that point. Yeah, that's exactly a very good point, is that you can, if you have an algorithm that's fully developed in LabVIEW API or LabVIEW primitives, you can run that and debug it in LabVIEW first, and then deploy it. Okay. So one common question is, okay, you guys provide some APIs. Um, what about the almost infinite number of shields that are currently available out there as part of the Arduino ecosystem? Do you support all of that? So the answer is a soft yes. We, we do support that by offering a uh, window within the compiler where one can wrap around existing uh, Arduino libraries, and then port that and create a set of API VIs and port that into the compiler. Into the compiler. So you, you can actually create your own uh, API set for any given shield. Uh, obviously, you, you need to know a little bit of C. Uh, not too much. Usually, the, the shields come with examples uh, on, on, in C, uh, Arduino sketch examples. So it's it's somewhat straightforward to, to look at the examples and understand what functions you need to call and then wrap around those functions. We have a full user guide as part of the, part of the user manual on, on how to do that with an example. Okay, so this is just snapshotting a couple new features and the intent is not to drill into what these features are. It's just to show you that we are maintaining this thing and, and updating and adding to it. Um, and no, it's not only LabVIEW that has bugs. Our tool also has bugs. So this is showing that we have closed 134 uh, issues uh, in a little over a year when this was produced. Just to reiterate how we know that there are issues, there's when you compile something, there's an option to send an error report. And so we get those error reports all the time to figure out what you guys are doing. And it may be something on your end that you figure out, or maybe something that we, you know, we, we see, oh yeah, that's a corner case that we didn't consider. And then we open up the case and then uh, fix it. Now, if you guys run into that, sometimes we don't get enough information on the reports. So it definitely would be helpful if you guys follow up. And uh, if you don't figure it out and say, hey, you want to send this error report, 
um, is there something I'm doing wrong? Because we have no way to contact you if we notice that, oh, this is something on a user that we should fix. You're just cleaning up the Oh, on the, on the do yeah, on the Dewey, we we added um, the ability to support interrupts, and not only that, the Dewey natively supports multiple interrupts, so we support three. Yeah, so that's kind of cool. You can essentially create a you know, parallel thread for the most part. Okay, so this is just a snapshot of, of the multiple uh, customers we have, and, and the idea here is to show that. It is being used not only by academia, but also you, you can see some pretty big names here. Uh, and these folks are using the compiler in their commercial applications as well. And, and like I said, they're, they're really pushing the limits of, of this. We have a support forum at this site. Very vibrant and sharing community. Uh, this is just, again, just a, a snapshot of a few uh, tools that were shared uh, by, by members of the community. So it, this is basically either cool applications that they created and want to share, uh, as well as uh, libraries, Arduino libraries that they wrapped around. Remember that, that choose lights back when you can, uh, that, that explain how you, you, you can wrap around that existing, uh, existing Arduino library. Folks share that as well. So this is really, really cool. And on that note, what we would like to sh uh, show you here now is one of those examples of a commercial application utilizing Arduinos and, and the compiler. And I would like to invite to the stage to show you guys that Scott Jordan, and this is going to be a mouthful, I just know it after a night of drinking all these words here. <laughs> so Scott is a manager and physicist by training with an MBA in finance and in venture management. Scott Jordan has driven a variety of business development and turnaround endeavors for large and small organizations. His expertise in motion control, automation strategies, and parallel process integration on the nano scale. Scott's patents for fast interfacing and deck resolution enhancements to help advance nano positioning performance more than a hundredfold, enabling capabilities for applications as diverse as nano patterning, single molecule biophysics, <coughs> atomic force mic microscopy, MEMS, microlithography, x ray inter interfer interferometry, and data storage. This is way too cute, no, no English speaker. Confirmed technology evangelist, Scott publishes and presents frequently.
And what you'll realize is that if you take this impulse and you divide it into sub-impulses, you can end up in a situation where there is no dynamic gradient. And that allows you to move from point A to point B and settle in the maximum or minimum time that physics allows. So we read this in the um, Arduino. It shows the Arduino way because of its processing power and its uh, big network space. We have a video. And so we did this. We took, uh, uh, in this case, a simple motion system. Uh, for instance, the new ratchet. You can see a pendulum moving. And you can use the groove to actually measure what the amplitude of that vibration is. And this is something that uh, can be generalized in any kind of motion type situation. Now, in this case, the motion command, going to the little motion controller that I was using, it's just a square wave. Move forward, move back, just like I demonstrated here. So what we did was we used a Fergelli servo controller and a Fergelli actuator. We used an Arduino way with a vigilant analog shield, which is the 16-bit input and output uh, with four channels, and pretty high speed, 100 kilohertz. Uh, that mounts on top of the way and is connected to the Fergelli controller. I used a separate Arduino program in my view to generate a square wave to generate the motion going back and forth, position command. So, using input shaping, we take <coughs> that input, square wave input, we modify it in real time. And as you can see, without input shaping, we get about four centimeters of breaking. With input shaping, we get about 75% less. I don't even ask that for you. So there are many other applications for this to improve precision and throughput of motion systems, ranging from 3D printing to general motion to that home automation bar that you show. So do you have any uh, questions about that? Let's talk about the last one. Thanks, Rob. Thank So uh, the message here is we're not competing with AI. <laughs> we're augmenting what AI has. For some applications, as we've shown here, simple embedded applications, Uno it's appropriate. If you start thinking about higher channel count, then you probably want to start thinking about something like a CDAC. And if you really need embedded horsepower, then the real platform is the way to go. Right? And now with, with the, the compiler, we're kind of extending the love your arrow here towards the love you everywhere concept. Some resources here, you probably don't need to write this down, this uh, stack of things is going to be shared. Yes, yeah, it's on the app, you can download it, I think, now. Yep. Um, this is our uh, our uh, websites. Uh, we we have some other cool projects uh, and products there for you to check it out. We have a uh, Love You for Raspberry Pi as well. We have some uh, hardware targets, so I encourage you to uh, take a peek. And uh, Eldine has also some cool uh, pro uh, products beyond this. Uh, love, uh, love You for Push Screen and what else? Yeah, uh, have Spreadsheet Express, uh, Excel Integration, Lab View. It's all in the tools network. Check it out. And right. please do this out before I open up for questions. Hammer away. Yes, sir. Does the compiler support going to C code or is it only binary? <laughs> um, we don't we don't open that because it would be a support killing machine if we did. Uh, however, <clears throat> however, we do open that if you're wrapping around an existing Arduino library. We do offer once you once you run it, you can actually see the the, the C code that is generated uh, from your wrapping, so you can yeah, understand what's happening. The process of wrapping, you have to define which inputs and outputs go into your subpi, correlates to which inputs and outputs in your Arduino uh, API calls. So it'd be really hard if you didn't see what the C code was. So in that case, as long as you're only using your API, we can show you the C code to help you do the mapping. Can I just use that or do I need to have the API run it every time that 
I don't agree. That's exactly why we, why we did this. So the, the whole goal of, of this tool is to simplify our lives. If you're creating a standalone application to run on the Arduino, you can program in the lab, you're just supposed to program in C. No, you wouldn't, you wouldn't. You actually, you wouldn't run that VI on, on your computer ever, right? So you, you're just using your your download machine just to create the application, and then once you're done, you say compile and download, and then that gets pushed down to the target. Thanks for the functionality. Okay. Yeah, one, one just add, one question we get all the time is being able to uh, copy the image. Um, you do have to connect to the compiler. If you're going to program another board or a new board, you have to be connected to the compiler on whatever machine you're running it on to download. You can't like take it offline to another computer and, and download just the, the hex file or the output binary. Yes, sir. Unfortunately, it doesn't because of uh, a limitation on the solo server uh, API set for lab view integration with the licensing scheme. So it's not, it's not that we couldn't support, but if, if they come up with something that supports the map, then it would be an automatic extension for us. But unfortunately, that's a third party uh, tool that we, we don't have control. <laughs> but you can use a virtual machine. Yes, sir. There seems to be a little bit of frustration with the ability to support uh, a parallel processing on this low end platform. Um, Given that, have you considered expanding your support to a chip that does do that from parallel? Um, so, actually, the GUI does support parallel processing. Uh, it's just not something we've implemented yet because um, it, it gets pretty complex to, you know, for us to support that and figure out when can we run things in parallel and um, whatnot. But as far as parallax, we haven't looked into that specifically. Philippe has done some work on the uh, Raspberry Pi, as you mentioned. Yeah. The reason I was asking is that, that particular chip, the, 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 the propeller chip, has eight cores and it's hardware time slicing. So it seemed like it'd be a very interesting chip for this community to use. Yeah, we, we are, it, it's the good old battle of small companies, right? Where you where invest you your time and, and dollars. Uh, so we're constantly uh, hearing community feedback. And, and prioritizing the, the requests that we get. Because unfortunately, I, I wish I could. I wish I would be rich and then would need to pay bills. Uh, then I would probably go after all of these things because I mean, they're extremely cool. This is amazing stuff to work on, but unfortunately we, we can't. Yeah, our original intention was just for these really simple applications that are fitted for single threaded. But then as the community started using it, they're like, oh, why can't I do this, can I do that? So we've built in a lot of complex functionality because of that. But yeah. So stop asking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, thanks for that. Yeah, thanks. Say that again? That's, that's also true. Yes, you can all, yes, they're very cheap. You can also, yeah, you can always use more than, that was a question here. I was curious, what version of lab were you testing on or what's your version? Uh, 2014 and better. Yes. Do you have mechanisms by which uh, code running on the Arduino could be communicating with lab code? Right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, you can do it serial link. Okay. In fact, there's a serial ex serial example, shipping example, that shows exactly that. So the, the PC would, would work as a as a host, and then you have the Arduino running whatever and pushing pushing data up and back and forth. Yes. Yes, you can if you develop two applications. One will run embedded on the on the Arduino, talking serially back up to the host, and then on the host you can do whatever you want, right? And send messages down. Can you put like a plug, for example? Yeah. You can do everything. Necessarily <laughs> <laughs> quick, all those examples are pretty much in the examples. Pulling a button, there's examples for all pretty much everything. And it goes into detail about how you wire up the Arduino, um, what you know to use, and then everything from temperature, analog acquisition, accelerometer acquisition, PWM, interrupts, 
phone generation, serial I squared C, LCD, RGB LEDs, SD card, SDI I squared C, servo, EEPROM, memory optimization, debugging, tons of examples. Yes, sir. Yeah. Oh, you showed the example earlier with the in placeness. You mentioned you trick the compiler into doing the placeness. Yeah. Is that just by virtue of using your toolkit? Um, because I didn't see anything explicit on the block diagram like a DVR and in place that forced that to happen. So right. That happen? Yeah, it's just the way the compiler interprets the lab view code. Okay. And it just works out that way. Unfortunately, it's not as more straightforward or obvious to the developer. If you support like someone using a DVR and an in place structure so that it's obvious to someone else looking at it, that happen? Not currently, okay. but that's, that's, that's something we're yeah. evaluating. Yeah. Okay. Yes? Yeah. Uh, what's the difference between the two? Yes. Uh, great question. The question was, how is this different than links? With links, what happens is uh, links pushes uh, a runtime down to the Arduino, uh, and, and you need to be connected to it. Uh, so if you're, let's say that you're just doing a LED flipping on, on Uno, you probably take 75% of the Uno because it needs to push a lot of stuff in there. And with this, we only push the application itself, so there's no run. That's probably the most relevant difference. Yeah, for our doing this, if you're referring to, I don't know if you want to talk about Links 3.0, which is a little bit different now. Right, so 3.0 does deploy to Raspberry Pi and Beagle mode now, is that correct? However, it's education use only, right? Edu yes, it is. And, and, and one cannot run a front panel uh, uh, headless, right? So if you hook up a monitor to a Pi, you won't see the front panel, right? So to have a front panel, you have to have your development machine hooked up. Whereas the other option, you can actually hook up a monitor and you'll see the user interface running. Embedded in Pi as well. As far as licensing, you said it's 499 for the enterprise and all that. What happens if I have multiple seats and I don't want to have that as a service? Right. It's, it's a single user license. Um, so you, and, and we follow the AI model. <laughs> so you can, if, if you have a single user, you can install on up to three machines. So you can install on your home machine, or black box, or PC or whatever, but it's a single user license. We can talk about if, if you have some specifics, we can talk about offline. Yes, sir? Single seat user, multiple targets, right? Yes. Targets. Yeah, yes. Yes. right. That's a good question. So the way the targets work, uh, you do have to have the Arduino IDE installed with the compiler. You don't actually have to run it. That is one good way to debug code as well. Like if you're building an API, um, and it's not working, you can definitely run the Arduino uh, built-in ID example to make sure your hardware works first. But what I was saying is that we pull the boards list, all the boards the Arduino ID supports, we pull that straight from the Arduino uh, library. So if they include support for a new board, it will actually show up in our compiler in the boards list. However, it doesn't mean that we've actually tested with it. There's a subset of boards, like five or six, that we've actually run a gamut of tests on to make sure our compiler does exactly as it should for all the primitives that we support and all the APIs we support. Um, so as they add more boards, it doesn't necessarily mean that it will work, but you can definitely try it. Yeah, and there's no deployment license. I don't know if that, that was the yeah. focus, right? Yeah. yeah, you can deploy it to as many as you want. I think we have time for one more. Yeah, we have time for a couple more. Yes, yeah, sir. What was the, what's the newest version, and when, when did you release it? The newest, what is the number of numbers? 10021, I think. It was like three weeks ago? Four no, weeks ago? it was longer than that. A few months ago. Time is a feeble construct. <laughs> <laughs> Especially this week. We can show you where to get that information. Yeah, it's, it's on gEverywhere.com. There's a there's a release notes and it yeah, tells exactly what features were changed or what was released, the features and what the date was. I think we pushed like 10 patches in, in a year, 10 or 11. Yeah. Yes. Mm 
Yeah, well, normally if you're doing like a high frequency application like that, um, you probably wouldn't do it that way. You may do a PWM, uh, and a PWM is not much faster than that. Um, you can probably crank that up pretty high. I'm not sure what the limitations are. Um, I think the, what did I say on the interrupt it was, if you're doing it that, with that method, the interrupt has a max frequency. case you have to make a duplicate you know it's the same code and add, the, the naming is what I'm concerned about like the naming of the VI um, but what it essentially does for the callback is it creates a function and then the timer interrupt is just mapped to that function so theoretically you have two timer interrupts that should be able to call um, that same function correct with that we thank you very much hope to see you here in May next year and if you have any other questions, please come here and talk to us. Thanks for the information.